Hey, uh, Daniel chapter 12, it's the final, it's the culmination, it's the ending. Uh, I'm excited uh, because you hung in there with me, even though I'm uh, not one of those super intellectuals. But um, let me once again assure you that uh, this morning you're going to get the big picture. If you're looking for the detail, there are people who've done a much better job than I could ever do. All right, so please don't, uh, I'm not the end of the story, all right? And uh, uh, so uh, please remember that. Now, Lovey, can I do, you, do me a favor, please? Can you, um, on my desk there, there's some membership certificates. I've got to uh, uh, um, invite some new members of our church uh, later on. Um, okay, Daniel chapter 12, we'll read, we'll get into it. Let's go. Thank you. It's on the screen for all those that know. Thank you, love. All right. Here we go. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who is charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, David, shut up the fill the book. Is that batteries? Um, and you, and, but to you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book till the end and the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time, and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end of all these things, finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Sometimes like all of us, hey? Then I said, O oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way down, for the words are shut up and sealed until the end, time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offerings is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days, but go your way till the end and you shall rest and, and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. Just up to there this morning. There we go. Uh, for those who don't know, if you haven't studied the Bible, if you haven't studied the um, uh, Daniel, uh, let me just tell you that this is one of the chapters where people get um, tossed into the whole argument of whether there's a thousand years, another thousand years, premillennium, pan millennium, uh, tribulation, and all that kind of stuff. And if you want any of those answers about all of the things, let me tell you my view. My view is very simple, just like me. My view is pan millennium, which means it will all pan out in the end, all right? So if you wanted to jump into any one of those debates, do not do it with me. I don't go down this route. I know that Jesus is coming. When? 
Nobody knows the Bible says he will come like, chain, uh, like pain, birth pains. And I've been a father, and every single time we've never been able to predict the time or the hour or the minute, okay? Uh, one o'clock in the morning, there I was on my way to Royal Brisbane. I, why do they always come at one o'clock in the morning? What's wrong with these children, man? If you have babies, tell them to arrive on time, okay? I know why doctors like doing caesareans. They can plan it for the exact minute. Anyway, that's a story for another time. I just want to tell you that me and my wife are pretty opposite in the fact that Lauren loves winter and I don't. I don't like the cold air. I don't like the wind. I don't like to get up in the morning in the dark. I love the sun shining on my brow. We lived in Melbourne for a year, and I've got to tell you this, I did not like it. You know what I mean? I remember getting up in the dark, you know what I mean? Going to work and putting on and waiting for that heater to kick in. It would take about a half an hour before you thawed out. And then I'd go home at four o'clock in the afternoon in the dark. You know what I mean? Do you remember those days? Anybody been to Melbourne? Look, two weeks is enough and preferably in summer. You know what I mean? But even then in summer at nine o'clock, you're still walking around like it's daytime. Anyway, it's a good place for a holiday, nice restaurants and all that kind of thing. Um, but I love uh, summer. And the good thing is that I noticed that in Queensland, we have 300 days of, of sun a year, which is quite nice. So if you're online and ever thinking about moving to Queensland, 300 days of sun a year. It's wonderful. Except the last couple of weeks when every time I met somebody, they said, gee, we need some sun. Um, but it's been good to have sun back drying up everything. Uh, but th there's always hope when there's winter that summer's coming. You know, there's always that hope. You know, can you imagine living in places where it's just cold and where you don't see summer? And when summer comes, it's still like winter. You know what I mean? I talk to my friends who live in America, and they don't like the snow. I just want to one year have a white Christmas. Just one year. You know what I mean? Just go there for a couple of weeks. But they tell me that the snow is terrible and the icy roads and getting up in the morning to clean the path and everything is just terrible, they say. But, you know, imagine not having that hope of, of there's summers coming. There's, you, you know, just being dark all the time. I was speaking to my mate and the sermon came to my mind on Friday night and he was telling me he's Swedish and he lives in Sweden. And he married an Aussie. And I said to him, so why don't you stay in Sweden? He said, my wife hated it. The cold and the darkness and she got depressed. I can get that. People get depressed when they don't see uh, that summer's coming, that there's something on the horizon. I think the truth is us as children of God and as people, that we need some kind of hope that there's going to be something better, that there's going to be something that's ahead that we can look forward to. The Bible talks in 1 Corinthians 13 about faith, hope, and love. And I met a man who had three daughters, and he called them. Isn't that wonderful? But we need all three, you know what I mean? We need faith in God, we need love of God and the love of people, but we need hope. We need something to tell us that there's happiness ahead. Because let's be honest, we live in a world where it doesn't look too good, all right? So don't worry, the government will tell you everything will be okay. Uh, yeah, salaries are going to increase, Medicare, you're going to get better care. Older people, you, you're just going to be looked after. Don't worry, everything will be good under the current government, okay? We all know that that's not true. No matter what government, the world is getting to be more difficult. Things are changing. You know what I mean? That's the reality. And we need some hope. We've got to know that there's hope at the end of the tunnel. I was reading a thing about, uh, about people that are struggling with life and um, struggling with uh, get, coming to terms with this thing. And they were saying that, that people uh, are struggling and that they, they turn to suicide. Why? 
Because even though they're in their struggles, they, they cannot see a way forward. They cannot see that there's hope. They cannot see that their struggles are coming to an end. They say, we can't see a future change in our current circumstances. And so they give up on life. But we, I'm happy to say that the church of Jesus Christ is the one place that offers hope to people. That despite all that's happening in the world and its problems and, and the, the dishes every day and the washing every day and the work every day, that there is hope that there will be one day when this will all come to an end, where there will be no more crying, no more tears, no more sadness, and we will be with Jesus. There is hope. Until then, well, we've got to hang in there. In Psalm 137, should have it on the screen, Psalm 137, it says this, you know it well, don't you? It's a good song. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we, were rem when we remembered Zion. I think somebody's got a phone on or something. Here we go. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and we wept when we remembered Zion. So yeah, with these people that were exiled and they were sitting there and they were remembering Jerusalem. They remembered what, what happened in the olden days and they they sitting there and they they weeping. Uh, for there our captors asked us for songs. And so the captors said to them, well, sing us a song. To which they reply, how can we sing a song in a foreign land? Uh, how can we sing a song in a strange land? How can we sing these God songs when, when we're captive, under captive? And the truth is that you and I all know that this song wasn't just applicable for them, but it's applicable for us. Because you and I, church, this is not our home. We're just a passing through, the song says. This is not our home. Our home is in heaven. Our home is with Jesus. And yes, we are all captives to this world, this world of sin, this world of evil. We are. But one day we will be free from all of this. And that's the hope of Jesus Christ. But what do we do in the meantime when people tell us to sing and be happy? Well, it's hard to sing a song of praise and worship in a strange land if you don't have hope. If you do have hope, you can, because you know that even though you've got present circumstances, that there's hope in God. If you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, that's all right. I'm going to provide a little summary for you this morning. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12 are part of God's uh, of one vision, one revelation. Chapter 10 serves as a little bit of an introduction. Chapter 12 provides the detail of this vision, and chapter uh, 11 and chapter 12 is the conclusion thereof. In chapter 10, verse 1, it tells us uh, um, that Daniel was in the third reign of Cyrus and that this vision appeared to him. Where did it appear to him? Well, he was on the banks of the Tigris River looking over the river and he had this vision and he, uh, uh, to which he then, uh, the passage tells us that he started to mourn for three weeks. So he had this vision of all that was going to happen and clearly it wasn't a nice vision. And so for the entire three weeks, it tells us this, that he didn't eat, he never drank, nothing entered his mouth, he didn't wash, he didn't put perfume on, or nothing for three weeks. He was serious. The vision was serious. And he cried. He mourned, the Bible tells us, for some period. And then in, in, in verse 10, it says, And behold, a hand touched me and set, my tr uh, set me trembling on my hands and knees. And we are that he gets this visit by some angel, and the angel comes and shares with him and comforts him and, and takes his stress away for a certain amount of time. Uh, then verse 27 says, I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days, but I got up and carried on the king's business but I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. And then, 
The angel comes and he explains the vision to him, which is great. And the final words spoken to Daniel are words of comfort, words intended to turn the sorrow of, uh, of this chapter into joy. Now, as we come to the passage this morning, this is precisely what happens for the last chapters. He's been getting all these revelations of wars upon wars upon oppressions and visits. And we hear about all these Gentile powers under uh, that have persecuted the people of God, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians. Then came the Greeks and then came the Romans. Remember that statue of all the empires. And all of a sudden, these prophecies are bleak. Now, why would you want all these bad stories of the fact that you're going to be damaged and, and persecuted every single time by every single country? And Daniel then, remember, got this vision of that, that this will all end in 70 years and, uh, and everything's going to go back and the people will go back, but only a small remnant go back. The rest of them stay behind because they're enjoying the paganism. They're enjoying Babylon and everything that the city gives them, all the light and bright city lights, and they're enjoying it. They don't want to go back to Jerusalem. They're loving it too much. So what's going to happen? Well, Daniel says there's going to be wars upon wars upon wars and more oppression and more and more and more oppression. And Daniel was hoping that it would all come to an end. And God says, no, it's not going to come to an end. Why? Because the people haven't stopped their sinning. God told them, if my people call upon my name, humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land. But these people don't want to humble themselves. They choose the darkness more than they choose the light. And so the Lord tells Daniel, Daniel, unfortunately, there's still going to be a lot more time that these people are going to have to go through before the final time when Jesus comes. And so we have this very special angel that visits him, but it's a, a very, bl very bleak message that Daniel gives the people as they read all these prophecies. Okay, let's look at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. It starts with this phrase, and at that time, just for now, and at that time, He's been discussing what's happened at that time. What's happened at that time? Well, the Antichrist is ruling. He's taken over. Remember last week I spoke, spoke about the Antichrist called Antiochus Epiphanes. He came into the temple. He desolated the temple. He sacrificed a pig on the altar of God, sprinkled the blood over every single part of the temple he could, and stood there and declared himself to be God. Antiochus Epiphanes means the glorious one. And uh, uh, so he, ha he changed his name uh, to the Glorious One so that everybody would address him as the Glorious One. Well, the Jewish people were quite clever because they changed his name to Epimenes instead of Epiphanes, which meant madman. So when everybody was on the street shouting um, Epiphanes, all the Jewish people were saying, Epimenes, madman, madman, madman. You know what I mean? And he was furiated that he was one of the men who killed the most Jews in history. And he was the Antichrist. But then we realized that, that the Bible was talking about not only him, but an Antichrist that would come at the end of the world. One who would do exactly the same as in Antiochus Epiphanes. So in other words, it just gets worse and worse. I searched through my commentaries to find out how I could give you some points for today's sermon. And uh, one of the best commentaries uh, that I got a picture of to help us get just a good little brief outline of what's happening today was from uh, a man called John MacArthur, who, uh, who is a super intelligent man and knows much more than I do about this passage. He's written commentaries and commentaries on it. Anyway, he writes this, it is on the screen there for you. He writes this, that there will be a special distress, a special defender, a special de deliverance, a special destiny, and a special dividend. Now, I could never come up with so much Ds in all my life. But if that helps you remember what's happening in this passage, it, it helps me to understand that there's going to be distress, there's going to be a defender, a deliverance, a destiny, and then a dividend. 
Now, what do they all mean? Well, that's my job to help you understand this morning. So let's get into it. The first part, as I said, is that there's going to be this special distress. In other words, there's going to be just an incredible time of hardship. At verse 1, it says, At that time arise Michael, the great prince in charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since since the nation till there was time. In other words, it's going to be worse than all the times before. So this is the tribulation. Uh, you know, in Israel, the Jewish people, let's be honest, suffered. They suffered under the Babylonians. Then the Persians came along. Then the Greeks. Then the Romans. And then... The Crusaders, do you remember the Crusaders? How many Jews they killed? And then, that wasn't enough. Along came Hitler. And if you haven't read in the news this morning, thousands and thousands of Jews have been evacuated from Russia. And so it continues, the sufferings of the Jewish people. Israel is still being persecuted. God's word is still true. And so when we look at all these passages in, in Daniel, we, we're blown away. Because it's happened, just as Daniel said, 536 BC, thousands of years ago, everything Daniel said has happened. And you and I can say the Bible is true. Why? History tells us that prophecy has come true. And so... This passage says, and even to that time, it's, a, it's a, what we call a Hebrew, Hebraism, a Hebrew idiom. It means that it would, it's the worst that it will ever be. Exodus 19 uses this verse many times. The worst is yet to come. It's still going to come. Matthew 24 talks about the same thing. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famine, pestilence, earthquakes. All of this just at birth pains. You can call it climate control, climate problems. You can do whatever you want. There it says, famines, pestilence, floods, earthquake. It's all going to happen in the end times. Verse 15, when you therefore see all of these and the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, then let them be with Judea fleeing to the mountains. When you see the Antichrist desecrate the temple, he says, run away, go into the mountains and hide because he's going to destroy everything. And so the book of Revelation describes this final history in chapter 9. Let me just give you a little summary. It says this, one third of the sea destroyed the creatures in it and the ships on it. One third of fresh water and many multitudes of people who drink it. One third of the skylights, the stars, um, the hell's demons to overrun the earth, the slaughtering of the beast and the false prophet. Um, it all sends, all fresh water will be polluted, scorching sunlight will burn to death. Just read it in Revelation chapter 6 verse 19. It's all be there. It's going to be a time of distress. It's going to be a horrible, horrible time. And I pray all of us are gone before that happens. Oh, there is conjecture about whether we'll be there or won't be there, but I'll leave you to have that argument by yourself in the mirror. Whatever it does, there will be a time of distress. But here comes the hope. In the midst of this special distress comes a special defender. Look who comes. Arise Michael, the great prince who is in charge of people. Well, who was Michael? Well, Michael was one of the most powerful, is the most powerful of angels and been given throughout all of, histories, uh, uh, of history as the person responsible for defending uh, the people of God. In Jude chapter 9, we find him fighting Satan for the body of Moses. He had such care and concern for the people that he will not even permit the desecration of their dead bodies. Uh, and so, yeah, we have. Uh, then in verse 13, it says, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Michael assisted him. And then verse 21, it says, in all of this, there's none that works with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. God had assigned Michael a special task of caring for the Jewish people, of caring for Israel, so that whenever they were in distress, Michael would appear. And so, yeah, God sends this wonderful defender to help. And the truth is, church, that we can look back over history and look at how we've also been saved in many ways, because God is the protector. God protects us. And God, true to his character, sends a deliverer. Thirdly, 
There's this special deliverance. Look what it says. But at that time, your people will be, shall be delivered. There is a time when we were delivered. Jeremiah 30 says, but we shall be saved out of it. And then he goes on to say, and I will restore your health and I will heal your wounds. So there will be a time coming. There's no need to despair. There will be a time coming when people will be saved. And then fourthly, there will be a special destiny. Verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. I was speaking to a guy this week. He doesn't believe in life after death. So I said to him, so what do you think is going to happen when you die? He says, I don't care. They can do with me what they want. I don't want a funeral. I don't want anything. He said, just wave goodbye. What a thought that nobody thinks that there's life after death. There's got to be life after death. Praise God, the Bible tells us there will be life after death. The horrible thing is that it says this uh, for some everlasting life, for some everlasting contempt. I don't want to be in that place. I don't want my family, I don't want my kids to be in that place. I want them to know Jesus Christ and to have life. But the Bible says there will be a resurrection. There will be everlasting life. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 19. Do you notice that a lot of people in history have declared that there's no such thing as a resurrection, even Christians? And yet it's clear right through the Old Testament, many of the Old Testament prophets, and I can name them for you. Let me just give you one example. John, Job chapter 19, verse 25 to 7, 27. Listen to these words. I know my Redeemer lives. And at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet my flesh will see God. Whom I shall see for myself, my eyes will behold him. You get it? What do you think Job believed in? He believed in the resurrection. He believed that there would be life after death. The Sadducees never believed in the resurrection. Men who studied the Old Testament... Didn't believe in the resurrection. Crazy, isn't it? There is life after death. What a glorious hope. John 5 verse, 8, 5 verse 28. For the hour is coming which we are all that in the grave shall hear his voice, shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. There will be. There's a glorious hope that waits for all of those that know the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said everybody's going to come out of their grave. The bodies will be resurrected, some to life, some to death. That's the choice, life or death. And that's exactly what the angel says to the people in Israel, that there'll be a time of stress during this time. The Antichrist will come along. There'll be the horror of the battle of Armageddon, the overrunning power of demons, but there'll be a defender, Michael, who will come and stand in their way. And God will bring a deliverance and a special destiny. And then finally, there is going to be a special dividend. Now, what is a dividend? Well, if you're a businessman, you know what dividends are. Uh, you know, I've never received a dividend, but I'd like to one day. A dividend is a share. You get a share in the profits. You get a share in. It's a bonus. You know what I mean? So if you sell, if you're a salesman and you sell enough cars, you get a dividend, you get a commission, you get a share of the profits. Well, the Bible says that you and I, as children of God, are going to be rewarded for what we did here on earth. In other words, what we do here in this life, it means something. We're not just going ahead with our own life and, you know, just saying the prayer just that we get into heaven one day. No, that what we do here on earth, what we do for God and his kingdom, that there's rewards for it. What those rewards are, well, there's a lot of speculation. But the Bible does tell us that we will shine like stars. And in some sense, those who are faithful will shine brighter than those who are not. Why? Because the Bible says we bring glory to God. 
And so the more we serve God, the more faithful we are, the brighter the stars will shine, it says, in the firmament. We'll radiate the glory of God. We'll all be blazing suns in eternity. There will be a special glow for those that have been faithful to God. They shall sign as the stars forever and ever. And so that's it. There we have it. A distress, a defender, a deliverer, a destiny, and a bonus at the end. You've got to love those Ds. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but... Uh, you know, I hear all these stories about people who, uh, you know, ready to see Jesus. And I'm ready to see Jesus, believe it or not. Well, I think I'm ready, but there's sometimes I really don't think I'm ready. I need a few more years working on my personality and my character and all of that kind of stuff, you know. I don't think I'm going to be ready and standing at the gate and say, yes, Lord, I've done the good race, I've fought the good fight, you know what I mean? Because I'm not always that good. I fear I'll be there on bended knee saying, God, let me in. I probably don't deserve it, but let me in. But I wonder about myself maybe driving on a plane, looking over the Brisbane River as I fly, you know, and the captain comes on and says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to tell you, but our, both our engines have failed. Please say goodbye to your loved ones. And I think that my head says I'm going to be with Jesus, but my stomach tells me something else. And I feel that as children of God, we know we're going to be with Jesus. We know that there's hope. We know that there's a future, but we still battle with the day-to-day -day living of life. We still battle with the, the problems of the government and how much money we're going to get and the boss that doesn't like us and the wife that irritates us and the, and the kids that are all begging for more money and more money. Not my kids, other kids, but, you know, uh, all this kind of stuff. We still live with the battles of normal day-to-day -day life and we need some hope in all of that don't we just to calm down the stomach because we're living in two worlds the spiritual world and yet you're on earth and even though we need that transformation of Jesus changing us to be more like himself the truth is we are still human so let me give you a quick four things that I think we should hold on to as people of hope the first is this. Friends, hang on tightly. God knows you. God knows your struggles. God knows your pains. God knows what you're going through. God knows the partner that you're looking for, the child that you want, the dream job that you want, the struggles that you're going through. God knows. So hang in there. Please hang in there for the sake of Jesus Christ because he knows, he listens, isn't it lovely that he hears Daniel's prayer and sends an angel just to comfort him? God hears your prayers. You'll be surprised how God's trying to comfort you. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, he is able to understand our weaknesses. Have hope. God knows what's happening with you. Secondly, overcome despair with prayer. Don't you like that? Despair with prayer. When, love, when life overwhelms you, pray. Pray like never before. If need be, like Daniel, stop eating and pray. Turn to God. Ponder his truth. Remember this, that the Bible says in Romans that God intercedes on our behalf. He prays for you. Overcome despair with prayer. Thirdly, uh, when life comes apart, pull together with other people. Pull together with God's people. We need each other like never before, church. The church is a special place. We're not a cult. We're not a social club. We are a group of beggars showing another beggar where to get food. We need each other. I need you. You need me. I might irritate you, but you still need me. We need each other. We bear each other's pains. 
We bear each other's worries, pull together when life comes apart. And lastly, let's be honest. In this world, evil exists. It does. We spoke about Daniel a couple of weeks ago. There, there is cosmic war taking place for your heart and your life. The devil doesn't want you to be in church. He'd prefer you to be at home somewhere doing something. He doesn't want you, yeah. He doesn't want your life. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says his word will never return empty. Did you know that? His word. In other words, when you come here every single week, a, a miracle takes place. Why? Because you are changed. You, the minute you walk out the door, you'll be different because God's word will change you. His word never returns empty. Evil exists, but it doesn't win. And so Daniel gives us great hope here. He tells us, church, that there's going to be a tough time, but that God will send a defender who will deliver us, that one day we will be part of this resurrection and we will be rewarded for our faithfulness. So keep on hanging in there. Hang on tightly. Overcome despair with prayer. Pull together when life comes apart. And remember, evil exists, but it never wins. Never, ever. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for this beautiful word from, from Daniel chapter 12. Thank you for the church of Jesus Christ. Thank you for brothers and sisters. Thank you for the fact that you hear our prayers and you love listening to us. Lord, I pray for those that today don't have hope, that feel they're in despair, that they cannot move on, that are struggling. I pray that even today, wherever they are, they would know the peace and presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that peace that passes all understanding. And then, Lord, help us to pass this hope on to the world, to those that are blinded by the devil, that we would give them the hope of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.